A new Borat movie was recently released 14 years after the first. And once again, Sasha Baron Cohen is taking direct aim at the U.S. with his jaw-dropping, controversial brand of satirical humor. Dr. Robert Saunders is known as the world's leading Boratologist. He's a professor of history, politics, and geography at Farmingdale State University, an internationally recognized researcher in the field of nation branding, and the author of The Many Faces of Sasha Baron Cohen, Politics, Parody, and the battle over Bora. Thanks so much for joining us from Switzerland this morning, Dr. Saunders. Well, thank you for having me and, and happy to talk about uh, Borat, hopefully, perhaps for the last time. Yeah. The movie streamed into some 1.6 million homes in the first four days. It's hard to know where to start with the character or the man behind the character. So let's start with the crass Borat. Who is he? Where is he coming from? And why can't we look away? Right. Well, uh, yes, as, as you point out, the first film came out uh, in 2006. Probably much of the world thought that, that Borat was, was a thing of the past. Uh, but as you say, this time, this crazy times of COVID, he did appear on our uh, on streaming on our screens around the world by Amazon Prime with, with a follow up to, to that film. Uh, the character, who is he? Well, Borat is, uh, according to uh, the, the framework that Sacha Baron Cohen, uh, who I'm sure we'll talk about uh, shortly, has put together, is he is a reporter sent out from Kazakhstan, from the Republic of Kazakhstan, to discover uh, what's going on initially uh, in the United Kingdom, and then later on taking the show on the road to the United States, where the, where the first film took place, uh, as well as the second film. Uh, uh, he basically plays on the notion of the uh, quirky foreigner who is ignorant of American mores uh, and gets himself into all sorts of trouble, uh, basically trying to, quote unquote, report stories uh, back back to Kazakhstan. Uh, the, the way he interacts with, with people is basically to demonstrate uh, misogyny, uh, anti-Semitism and sort of a, a complete lack of understanding of, of the modern world. Um, and this leads, uh, in theory, uh, basically, uh, to laughs, A, and B, uh, B really more a critical approach to uh, some, of, some of the issues that kind of underlie uh, American culture, both then and now. Well, I would seem the resurgence of Borat is quite fitting for 2020. Is there a difference in his approach between the first and second film? And given the times, are we likely to react differently? Um, I think the approach has remained uh, pretty much the same. Uh, a lot of the critiques of, of the film and one, one that I share is that really Borat as a character hasn't evolved much uh, since 2006, while American culture, and I would say culture uh, not just in the U.S., but around the world has also uh, really moved on. Uh, we see a rise in populism. We see a rise in sort of this this uh, full-throated forms of, of racism, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, uh, these things that, that Borat un, really, quote unquote, uncovered back in 2006, in many ways through Twitter and, and other forms of social media and, and, and the political discourse in general, these things are now out in the open. Uh, so, so watching it it, it, it does create a bit of a disconnect because what is Borat uh, really, uh, you know, really exposing now? The one difference is, is he's recognizable. Uh, the, the movie, the, the, the sequel kind of plays with that, with people recognizing him on the street. And so he has to go into disguise uh, in, in, in other sorts of disguises uh, along the way to achieve his, uh, his both political and comedic goals. Well, he repeatedly crosses the line into taboo territory, and the way he approaches these topics is often too squirm-inducing, uncomfortable to watch. Is his approach successful in revealing what he sets out to reveal? Well, I, th I think both as this character, as Borat, and, and, and also as Ali G, which was, was meant, uh, this sort of rapper character that was meant more for a, for a British audience and, and British targets, uh, when we go back to the late 1990s, when he began the, the, this comedic approach uh, uh, to these subject matters, it, it did work in many ways. Uh, I, I think it got people, it, it basically it, it encouraged uh, people who had ideas that were, uh, that were really retrograde to, to express those ideas on camera because of the, the, the way that the, the sort of bit was, was structured. Um, 
as I said before, I think I think we've all kind of moved on. It, it doesn't mean that this there's no place for this type of satire, but but I think really satire, it, it, as of all the forms of comedy, is the one that is most that needs to be most fluid and move with the politics of the day, because satire at the end of the day really is about changing something. It's about punching up against you know against power. And so if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, and the power structures change, really at the end of the day, the the satire falls flat. Well, let's talk a bit about the man behind the character. I think many would be surprised to learn of Baron Cohen's education and his background, which could have led to a career in academia. Where was he educated? How and why did this career path take a turn to satire and comedy? Yeah, actually, in, in conducting the research for my book, I interviewed uh, Neil Ferguson, who is a, a, a quite a, a well-known historian who who uh, who taught uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, taught him history at, at, at Cambridge. Uh, and, and Neil Ferguson expressed a little bit of regret that, that Baron Cohen didn't go into the field of academia like so other, some other members of, of his family actually did. Um, he really is someone who, if you look at the long arc of, of his life, he, he's always been committed to anti-racism. Um, he's someone that cares very much about, about Jewish issues, uh, spent, spent some time in Israel. Um, and and his, his comedy kind of evolved over time. He began actually making fun of his own culture, making fun of Jewish culture in London specifically. Uh, uh, but then he shifted really to more of focus on, on looking at racism and looking at anti-Semitism. And like you say, he's, re he's really pushed the boundaries uh, uh, very, very far, being condemned by the Anti-Defamation League and, and other organizations who really feel that, that the humor is, uh, is not achieving uh, what it's supposed to, that it is, it is actually encouraging uh, uh, these these really sort of hateful forms of of speech and and action in the world. I think it's kind of interesting that he got his comedic feet wet in the same place that Monty Python's Flying Circus did. Yeah, he he did. He kind of jumped. There's there's a tradition that goes on in Britain about how you're supposed to go through the ranks. Uh, in many ways, he, him operating in the late teen, uh, late 1990s, he's kind of jumped over some some of those things. You're supposed to go to this festival or that festival, this this uh, this comedy club or that comedy club, and he kind of went straight to uh, uh, straight to television, uh, and and was picked up over time. People started to see him in, in his characters. He was able to develop them uh, uh, in ways. That really appealed to appealed to a younger audience in the in the early two thousands, uh, and and as I often point out, we we need to remember that Borat wasn't always from from Kazakhstan. He actually began as a as this character named Christo, who was from Albania. Uh, but it shows that kind of evolution and 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 really the 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 ways in which Sasha Baron Cohen is able to move very very quickly and uh, and kind of take advantage of the situation to to achieve his goals, which again for me was uh, you know somewhat surprising. At kind of how stale this this most recent movie was when when you think you had sixteen you know or, or fourteen years to really think about uh, uh, what to do next with with the Borat character, if anything. Indeed, when in your book actually you talk about the intersection of culture and politics, and we see that now more than ever that the divisions, those lines between real political figures and the media and entertainment are so blurred. Do you see a difference in the way Baron Cohen creates characters and say the way politicians create personas for the public? Yeah, that was that was one big focus of, of the book when I was when I was writing it back in, in the mid 2000s and, and into the later uh, around 2008. And I was talking about celebrity politicians at that time and, and the blending between politics and celebrity. And I was referring to to, to people like Tony Blair, uh, uh, these these po elected politicians who tried to to put on airs as as a sort of celebrity of sorts, and now fast forward to where we are today, uh, uh, we have uh, a former reality television host, uh, Donald Trump, uh, basically is ending his his first term, you know, his first four years, and and it seems to be only four years as as president. Uh, we have Imran Khan running uh, Pakistan, so a, a sports figure. So. It's it's really jumped uh, jumped to another level from from what we what we would have talked about is is this mixture between uh, celebrity uh, and politics uh, when you're talking about uh, 2006 2007. 
Um, Sasha Baron Cohen, right? He, uh, he, he really was engaged with that, that intersection between, between culture, politics, and journalism. And, and again, this is another thing that, that I talked about in the book, that he was part of this, this move in the new millennium that we would associate with Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert, uh, now today John Oliver, uh, those, who, those, those figures who come at the news from the angle of comedy. But at the end of the day, particularly for a younger generation, these are, are becoming their, their main sort of sources uh, of news content, of political content, whether we talk about Bill Maher or, or, or others. So um, really, I think that trend that we saw early on in the 2000s continues apace to this very day. Well, we may never look at Borat in quite the same light again. Dr. Saunders, thanks so much for taking some time. Did I just recently read that after his well-documented feud with the Kazakhstan government, that the tourism board is adopting one of his most popular sayings? Yes, you, you were absolutely right. There was a kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, advertisement uh, uh, called Very Nice, as it's been labeled. And, and basically... I, I don't think it's a long-term thing, but in, in in a time where we have very little international travel, I think the Kazakhstani government, rather than reacting the way that they did the first time around, uh, which was really pushing back and even asking for for him to be, uh, you know, you know, squelched uh, for the for, for national governments to step in and, and stop him from from doing this this comedy. Now I think the Kazakhstani government has kind of learned it's better just to just to play ball and uh, try and make, uh, you know, make lemonade out of lemons. And so they, yes, they have this, uh, this short YouTube advertisement uh, called Very Nice, where they talk about how the, the people of Kazakhstan are very nice, the geography of Kazakhstan is very nice, the cuisine is very nice. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely uh, the Kazakhstan government now trying to be in on the joke. Well, it's very nice of you for taking some time to join us on News Point 360 today from Switzerland. Thanks so much, Dr. Saunders. We really appreciate it. Thank you.